delighted to be here. Uh, as you probably know, tomorrow is the 72nd uh, anniversary of the Doolittle Raid. So uh, today's finding is, is quite appropriate. This presentation is going to be divided into uh, about five different units uh, of history. Uh, and uh, the first one is leadership. Uh, the second one is uh, Minneapolis Connection. The third one is the Raid. And the fourth one and the fifth one are the after effects. Uh, and I think that you're going to find something new and interesting in all of the sections. And if you haven't thought about it, uh, the uh, aspect of leadership uh, will probably go down in history over you know, the next 100 years, uh, 175 years. It, it, it'll probably rank up there with things like uh, when Hannibal uh, took elephants over the Alps. Uh, it was a, uh, something had to be done. Starting at the very top, got on the cases of all of his military leaders and he said, I want something done and I want it done now. And he harassed his people mercilessly uh, throughout the period of uh, the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor until early April when he was told that his troops had put together a package that they thought he would like. But he had kept picking on it and they produced. So we talk about leadership from the top down. Roosevelt knew that something needed to be done uh, because after uh, Pearl Harbor, as you probably know, things continued to go to hell in a big handbasket as the Japanese Far East full prosperity uh, operation continued to expand and expand. And we had already taken the hit at uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, so we were in pretty bad shape. And what was needed basically was uh, a morale booster of some sort. So, when we look at the situation uh, in the sector of the war in Japan, is that the Japanese basically had a large sphere uh, of property that they uh, that they had taken over, and so the plan of attack was, uh, and the two Korea two uh, naval captains work this off. The first one was, as the story goes, was overflying uh, the Tucson uh, Air Base uh, and noticed that they were at painted uh, carrier decks uh, for the planes to practice on. And he thought, hey, what if we put bombers uh, on board aircraft carriers? I wonder if that will work. Uh, they gave it to another captain, Duncan. Duncan uh, moved to heaven and earth and the Hornet, which was still on the East Coast at that time, was utilized at the very beginning. Is it closer? Is it closer? What if I just shut? It could be like Martin. Let's, let's give it a shot uh, uh, without the mic. And uh, Duncan's plan was Let's get uh, some aircraft out on a uh, aircraft carrier and see if it works. And they had options, the B-12, uh, up to the then the B-26, which was, of course, known as the, later on, as the Marauder, uh, the A-26. Uh, it was also one of the newer aircraft, and it already had a bad reputation as a widow maker. So the statistics and the slide rule fellows figured out that the B-25 was going to be the optimum aircraft for this mission. In the file behind me, I have a, a sheet that basically says, here's how they wanted to do it. Where is it again? Did you just probably shut it off? Okay. Okay. I'll lower my voice. Right here. The, uh, the plan of attack was that they would uh, lead off with a very lightly loaded B-25. The next B-25 would be uh, uh, medium load, and the third one would be a heavy load. And for reasons that I'm not quite sure of, it looks like they decided this thing would work with one takeoff. I don't have any data on whether all three B-25s actually flew off the Hornet. 
but they determined that number one, if you head into the wind as you normally do, uh, yes, a B-25 could get the job done. So that was the beginning. Now we're going to do a fast jump to uh, Minnesota and the Minnesota connection. And most of you know about this, uh, courtesy of uh, is Jim Johnson, still here. Um, okay, and there was data from Bill Ellis. I don't know if Bill was ever here. And of course, you all remember Brian Moon. Uh, everybody that, that I've just mentioned has had a part in keeping the history of uh, the Doolittle Ray alive. And Bill Ellis and Jim, I know, are part of the Minneapolis connection. I'm not going to dwell on the Minneapolis connection except to tell you some things that you may not know. Uh, and some things that you may think you know, and hopefully we will get you straightened out to a certain degree. Uh, number one, all of the aircraft that came in uh, came out of the, uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, and they were uh, uh, brought into uh, Minneapolis uh, and run through mid-continent two by two. Uh, those that came in behind were parked outside. They were guarded. Uh, 24 hours a day by uh, well-armed uh, troops who actually uh, took at least one. Who uh, took at least one shot at uh, the party who wandered too close. Uh, the other thing that happened was they noticed that for some strange reason. Uh, the wings uh, underneath the B-25s were parked outside were strangely marked up. And the reason for that was uh, is that the people who were carrying the weapons uh, also had their bayonets uh, on a lock and load. So as they were marching under the wings, they were making scar marks on the wings. Well, they took care of that. Uh, the, the next thing you may not know is how close they came to losing this project. Okay. Uh, the next thing that happened was that uh, in the process of working on the aircraft, and they had uh, two craft in the aircraft, the other craft on the outside, is that when they got to the McKay uh, McQuay part of the equation, I give up. <laughs> that kind of defy good engineering, they took the McQuay tank and it was fully loaded and they brought it up and of course it was designed to fit into the top of the bomb bay uh, and occupy about a third of the bomb bay space which of course cut down the bomb load <coughs> considerably but they needed the fuel. And as they were bringing the unit up and this information comes from Roger Poor, uh, is that when they got it up to the top it slipped its shackles in some way, never to be determined, and the entire tank came down, and it broke its seals, and there was gas, ab gas, all over the floor, and there were people working on machines and doing different things in the hangar, and there was ab gas on the floor. And as Roger Ford described it, everybody froze in position realizing that if one spark uh, hit something, they were going to all die in a flash. Uh, two of the bombers were going to go, the entire hangar would have gone, and it probably would have taken one or two or maybe whatever was parked outside. And I don't know how many of you have ever heard that story. Let's go back to Roger Core. Uh, and we're going to whistle through the video part here uh, pretty quickly. And Roger Core will show up. I am convinced that the uh, tail guns and the story of the tail guns uh, in the B-25s is uh, born, uh, bred, bred born in Minnesota. Uh, I have never seen anything that connects it to anybody outside of Minnesota. And Roger Poor's story, uh, to me, three weeks before he died, was that he and uh, his partner, who he was an A&E, uh, and wanted to go to war, but because he was an A and E, he was kind of locked into this project. He would go to war, 
and served as a navigator on B-17s. But the story as he tells it is that he and his partner were talking about this. They were in the in the aft end of the B-25 that they were working on, working on the, uh, the gas tank situation. And they said, you know, without any weapons back there, these people are going to be at some risk. Because of course they had no knowledge of where planes were going. Nobody did. Pilots didn't know. They wouldn't learn about that until they were out to sea after the Hornet had made its way to San Francisco. So he then described exactly how they did it. And they were working with, as I recall the story, four by fours. They had a lathe uh, in the plant someplace in the factory, uh, and they made the machine guns out of uh, not broomstick handles, but they, they machined them uh, into dowels, and then they mounted them. And all of the pictures that you can see of uh, aircraft that were at Minneapolis if they happen to be an aft end shot, will indicate that the, they were installed here. They weren't installed at Elgin, they weren't installed in South Carolina. Uh, they were produced and installed here. So I'm gonna stick to that story uh, because I think I was talking to a guy who was there and you'll see a, see a picture of him shortly. And that's the Minneapolis story. Now we go to the raid and, and this is where most of you have some knowledge of it, so uh, let's get started with you know, what the dynamics were. Two fleets, two carriers, the Hornet and the Enterprise, 16-1 and 16-2, and all the auxiliary vessels, of course, are coming in to, uh, to Japan. Primary mission was Tokyo and all other cities down the archipelago and then out. And obviously they had to be careful about where they were going because Korea, all of it, belonged to the Japanese, had belonged to the Japanese when we gave it to them in 1907. So they had to come down the slot or they had to come down the sides. And we also know a little bit about the story of Ski, York Ski, who went up to Vladivostok because he was running low on fuel. You better. Okay. We try it again? Yeah. There you go. And I'll keep my hand off the green light. Uh, the ski story. There's probably some data that hasn't been released on the ski story. And there's a, a, a fellow out in, uh, in California who was introduced to me by Norm Avery who basically is considered the godfather of anything you want to know about B-25s, and he worked on them as a young engineer. Uh, and he believes that this one party has information that says they went to Vladivostok on purpose. Uh, part of the reasoning for that was is that the pilot, Ski, and the co-pilot spoke fluent Russian. And uh, so the, the rationale is this, is that even though they knew, we knew that Russia did not want to get involved with anything going on with Japan, uh, that that wasn't going to last forever. And so the ski mission, uh, if you will, might have been set up to bring uh, a B-25 in and, and carry the message to the Russians that we wanted them to allow our planes to land in Russia if they had to, because the, op the options were not very good. You land if you're out of the Aleutians, or if you're out of some of the other uh, areas, uh, you either land in Japanese territory, uh, or you land in the uh, North Pacific. So that was, you know, that's part of the unknown uh, issue of the uh, dual liberate. Was that, in fact, an intelligence mission? But we all know that uh, they had to leave early, uh, which cut down and changed the dynamics completely of the raid uh, because there wasn't going to be enough fuel to get to where they had to go, which is part of the end of this presentation. Where were they going to go? And so now we have the launch, which took, her, took part early in the morning. I think the wake-up call came uh, uh, when the battle stations went off after they figured out they had been discovered, and they had. That turned out to be true. The picket ship 
was not a fishing boat, it was a big ship, and that the information was funneled to Japan, that a carrier fleet uh, was heading towards Japan. Why it didn't uh, create more of a uh, armed response, nobody seems to quite know, but hey, it worked. So they left, uh, they left early, they started to leave at about 8.15. Uh, the good news was that the, the winds and the seas had increased, and so uh, every uh, knot that you could pick up by going into the wind added to their takeoff profile was going to make it possible for all 16 vessels to get off, 16 ships to get off. And of course, uh, Colonel Gulil uh, took the lead, uh, and he was the first one off, and everybody thought, hey, if he can do it, we can all do it. And they all did it, even though one of them made a mistake, and that is when you look at some of the early pictures, and I think we have one up here, uh, is that the, the flaps were down. Uh, uh, the guy who was flying, uh, number nine or number 11, forgot to put his flaps down, but even he got off. So uh, again, the uh, speed of the aircraft, when you uh, uh, had the aircraft lined up uh, with uh, six feet to spare off the island, uh, and with the pilot and the co-pilot stood on the brakes, and you wound up uh, the engines uh, until you got the RPM up there where it would just about shake the plane apart, and then uh, the shooter, uh, I always spook for that one. Uh, you know, said to go. Of course, the goal was based on the bow rising. Uh, and uh, when you look at some of the shots of the Hornet with the bow up in the air, you'd swear to God you were looking at a Russian jump jet carrier. It is so high in the air. But again, it, uh, the dynamics got the planes off all of them. The next thing that happened that doesn't get a lot of publicity is the fact that. Uh, each plane, plane had uh, uh, five, uh, I think five or ten, anyway, jerry cans. Uh, and the deal was uh, uh, put that gasoline in just as soon as you got off, you got level and you got oriented, uh, and uh, then dump the cans, but don't dump them before you uh, puncture them. And the reason they said that, uh, or told to do that, is that it was. Uh, uh, the, uh, their leader who said, I don't want a trail of red cans uh, to let the Japanese come back to the carrier fleet. Uh, and there's a, there's a kind of a funny story about that, but that's for another day. Uh, there was some humor in almost getting hit by a can, an empty can coming out of a plane ahead of you. But we'll cover that again at a later date. So they get off and they make the run and with their Mark Twain, which was believed to be about 20 cents worth of aluminum, which replaced the Norton. Number one, we couldn't afford to let the Nortons uh, uh, get in the hands of the enemy. Number two, the Norton wasn't worth a damn uh, uh, at anything uh, below 4,000 feet. So the uh, Mark Twain, the 20 cent Mark Twain, which was just an angled device, well, welcome, sir. Thank you for coming. Take 12 times 110, and you make about 15 passes. One bomb at a try. Uh, we're Marine Corps, we're not Air Force. We drop three times level. One bomb at a time. But I was curious, what size were the bombs that they dropped? 500 pounders. Oh, they were 500 pounders. Okay. Got some pictures. This guy who just showed up, by the way, this is uh, Ed, Ed Maga. Uh, like me, he's a Johnny. Uh, uh, and uh, we're kind of the, the black sheep of the Johnny family. And, and he went on and uh, flew phantoms uh, in uh, Vietnam. How many missions? 110. 110. I can't even count to 100. But anyway, uh, so the aircraft uh, get off, they do their thing. Uh, ski goes to Vladivostok, everybody else goes off. And basically, all of the aircraft. Uh, for two different reasons. One is uh, running out of fuel. Uh, a group of them bunch up right out to just south of Shanghai. Uh, and everyone else, because they picked up tailwinds uh, coming out of the, uh, either they came off this side or they came off this side, they did pick up tailwinds, so they got pushed further inland 
than they anticipated going. But they also knew that they had no place to go. There was no definitive information on where the air bases were. Uh, they were more concerned with whether they could even hit the shore, much less get to an air base. And so by this time it's uh, pitch black and everybody uh, who hadn't already hit the shore uh, as the uh, vapors get down and the engines start to uh, kick off, they put the aircraft, all of them, on uh, autopilot and bail out. And bail out they did. And the rest of the aircraft were scattered all over uh, the area south of Shanghai up to about 400 and 500 miles in, in this area uh, south of Shanghai. The good news was that Shanghai was not a place to land because it was under Japanese control. The other uh, aspects were was that the uh, geography of China was such that Japan and their military forces could not uh, maintain control over some of these mountainous areas. So basically, just about 100% uh, of the crews landed in pretty safe territory, except the ones we know uh, that were captured, a small number out of the whole group. But the, uh, the end of the day is that a large number were taken under their wing by the Chinese, and they were gathered together, and plans were put together to get them uh, marshaled and then out of, uh, out of China to fight again. The original plan had been that all the aircraft that they survived, had they been able to land at a given airport, uh, would have been turned over to uh, Chenault, and he would now have a bomber fleet, uh, as opposed to just his P-40s. Obviously, that didn't happen. It would happen later, but uh, I think the number was uh, the 10th Air Force uh, didn't have a bomber fleet. So now the raid is over. Uh, Doolittle's first reaction is, as he's sitting on the wreck of his airplane, is that he's going to get court-martialed. And obviously that was not the case, but every single aircraft uh, was either in the sea or look like this, and this is part of Whiskey Peak, and we're going to see a little bit of that uh, here in just a moment. But now we get into the hard part for the Chinese. Chiang Kai-shek, the peanut, as Stillwell called him, uh, was not let in on uh, this particular project, nor was Chenault, and the reason for that was the porosity of uh, intelligence going into the Japanese. And so as a result, that the coordination of the aircraft to get to known uh, places where they could land on unimproved uh, runways was gone. Now it's just a matter of getting the people out. In the process of getting the people out, we now get to the point where what price did the Chinese pay? What little uh, the peanut, Chiang Kai-shek, knew about this was he knew one thing for sure, is that if the Japanese got their nose bloodied, then the Chinese were going to lose a hell of a lot more blood. The reason he knew that was in 1937, which was the infamous rape of Nanjing, which is upriver on the Yangtze from Shanghai, for reasons that have never been explained by the Japanese and never fully apologized for, is that in one location alone, the Japanese would take out, through any number of horrendous deaths, uh, 300,000 people. It's called the rape of Nanjing, and there was rape, and there was also the loss of life. And while thousands of these people were beheaded, or stabbed, or bayoneted, or shot, and pushed into the river. Many more were simply pushed into uh, ditches, if you will. And if you have any doubt in your mind about whether the rape of Nanjing, like the Holocaust, ever took place, well, you go visit the Holocaust. 
Or you go to Nanjing, and then we have the Museum of the Rape of Nanjing designed in such a way that there's a section where you walk through it, and you walk down, and you walk down, and then finally you see, as you walk a long distance, the skulls, the bodies, the bones of the people who were pushed into these ditches. And that's your introduction to the Rape of Nanjing. Obviously, with the Doolittle Raid, the Japanese have something to respond to. And how are they going to do it? Well, we get back to the geography, if you will, of uh, China. The Japanese already had hundreds, thousands of troops in northern sector. They wanted Manchuria because they wanted the, the raw materials. They wanted the coal and they wanted the iron, both of which they didn't have. Uh, they've gone elsewhere for oil, Indochina, if you will. So they had many troops in northern China. The army and the navy were positioned in Shanghai and in other sectors, but they were pretty much isolated because there was so much more of China to control that they couldn't control. And you had Chiang Kai-shek, Little peanut, and you had Mount Zedong out there. So the Japanese really had their hands full based on what, what was going on. But there was going to be retribution. There was going to be a price to pay. And the price that was to be paid came down in what's called, and I'll ask Eva for some help. How do you pronounce this? Uh, spring and fall. Who's the reason I asked her to do it is the Japanese language for me is so convoluted that if you make a slight miss, you get it wrong, and all of a sudden you're talking about not spring and fall, but double suicide. And that's what two samurai warriors know instantly they're both going to die. So she pronounced it correctly. The plan, which was, I think, named after the fact, the spring-fall offensive meant that it was April, and so armed troops, some of them cavalry, by the way, moved down by various means, uh, truck and, and uh, uh, marine landing type operations, and they came into South China. end of the day in South China, another 300,000 Chinese died. One of the big differences was, and this is where Eva opened my eyes to this, because we went, when we went down into this, these areas, we would see these little places that were offbeat. They weren't tourist attractions. And they were basically little signs that said, it was just like you know the Burma shave sign, you know, something happened here, or the cross is an accident. You know, I have an accident here. I guess that's the one I'm thinking about. Uh, oil alive, shot, beaten, poisoned. You name it. Every method of death the Chinese and the Japanese could envision, they practiced on the Chinese people in the Shunju offensive. And where they got the biggest number was the fact that, well, these planes were going to land someplace. They figured out where they were going to land. They gathered the Chinese peasants, and they made the Chinese peasants destroy these airfields. You can guess what happened after they finished their labor. And that's what added to the 300 thousand total. The chances are probably pretty good is that Nanjing was higher than 300,000, uh, that the Doolittle Raid was higher than 300,000, uh, but it happened. And if you're a historian or if you're a military planner, uh, you have to think in terms of what can history tell you uh, and what's going to happen after the fact if you have a successful mission. Uh, 
we'll go real quickly here, and we're going to, this will, in effect, recap everything that we've just talked about to a certain degree. The man in red is uh, Richard Poor. This uh, young lady here is seated right over there. The man in the middle uh, is going to pay a horrendous price for getting us the original piece of this cave. Uh, Richard Poor is about three weeks uh, from going to the great hangar of the sky. Senior Master Sergeant for the Air Guard, General Weir, and yours truly are looking at the uh, place where this piece went. You probably all recognize Miss Mitchell and the way uh, Senior Master Sergeant uh, uh, Bruce Graham vetted this out was he, he took the major piece and he looked at it and where I could see nothing, he found serial number after serial number after serial number and he simply went to the dash six uh, that was in the library of an Anoka, matched up the serial numbers to find where the uh, part on the aircraft was compete, this would have fit. And again, uh, oh, uh, the father of the guy who was at the head of the, uh, the guard, somebody knows his name, I can't remember. Andriotti. Andriotti. Andriotti, got it. Okay, Aldridge, Andriotti, Weir, and Graham. This begins the chapter where uh, Eva plays a big role. That cover is this cover. This is the, let's stop this here before we get too far down. Through her contacts throughout China, she's the one that found where these pieces were, very few of them, uh, and when it was all said and done, she wrote a story about it. Uh, it would later come to haunt her in, in a couple of different ways. One of the hauntings still goes on, and that is uh, when the Chinese government realized that she had the audacity to write about Chinese history, thereby taking an opportunity away from them, they lashed out and basically sent the word back, and if you remember the picture of the old man in there, uh, if she ever shows up down there, kill her. Uh, we understand that the old man of the village was, as they say, coming out of the uh, Cultural Revolution, suicided. Uh, is that, uh, he ended up drowning in the river in the village that he was the village clan leader of. The other aspect of lingering uh, recriminations from the Chinese is that for a long period of time they kept trying to track her down in this country and trying to get pieces back. Their theory was they belong to China. My theory was, well, hell, they belong to China. They, they belong to America. Do a little pinning on his, uh, some of his Japanese medals. The real tall guy there, uh, Monch, uh, he's played by Robert Mitchum. The battle fighter. Oh, okay. These are just kind of seven second shots and, and, and we'll get down to some of the uh, uh, Medal of Honor. No court martial. The big difference between the court martial and the Medal of Honor. <laughs> I, I learned. And, uh, Part of the small villages uh, in China where we saw these various and sundry signs. The old man who uh, is suicided, he's the leader of the clan. Uh, and uh, I guess what really got the Chinese was all the village got for this 
was an American flag. And he seemed to be happy, they seemed to be happy, uh, but uh, that was all that France passed between us. No money, nothing. They gave the peace to us. They got the flag, and we got out of there, and boy, I'm telling you, we got out of Dodge as quickly as we could. Uh, tail guns, this is a Minneapolis picture. You're looking at Dowels, made in Minnesota. Uh, armed guard, I don't know that he's got his bayonet out. This is where the damage was done. Uh, again, tail gun, tail gun's in place. I don't know if he's got his, uh, his bayonet stuck on there. Uh, I think this was an aircraft that didn't make the trip. I'm not 100% sure of that. No bayonets, I think they took the bayonets off on that. End of the line. Did the Doolittle Raid do any good in terms of the end of the war? History is still being discussed, evaluated, and looked at. The general consensus is it made a lot bigger of an impact than anyone would have thought. And part of that reason is, is that after it took place, the Japanese realized that we had the capability of getting to Tokyo and that we had the capability of getting planes to China is that from China to here was a pretty short trip. So the troops up here basically had to stay there. Uh, the troops throughout the war who were in Taiwan had to stay there. The troops who were in Korea had to stay there. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of troops. And the other factor that was taking place was that we were in the process of owning the skies and owning the sea. And so not only were they forced to keep uh, military assets uh, to protect themselves, they had to worry about uh, the Generalissimo, Chiang Kai-shek, they had to worry about Mao Zedong, and they had to worry about America getting land-based aircraft in here. Meanwhile, of course, the island campaign is going on all up and down this area. The Battle of Midway has taken place, and the tide of war has changed. But now we're getting towards the end of the war. And this is where things really get kind of sticky. Russia, up here, basically agreed at Potsdam that 90 days after the cessation of hostilities in Europe, that yes, they would invade and go to war against Japan. Going to Potsdam, Truman had absolutely no idea of whether he had an ace in the hole, a wondrous weapon. He agrees to the 90-day program. And guess what? Stalin lives up to his 90-day 90, 90 promise. But on the way back from Potsdam, he gets the word that Trinity worked. So all of a sudden, you've got an ace in the hole of an, of a, an atomic weapon. But meanwhile, Russia is beginning to make a move on the 91st day. And they come in and they rape and pillage virtually all of Manchuria. They capture hundreds of thousands of Japanese. They take factories apart almost brick by brick and transport them back. And we can see, we know, that basically our hard-won island campaign could come to hell in a handbasket unless we can stop the war and stop the war now. There it goes. Your ace in the hole. Hiroshima. Nothing happens. Nagasaki. And then something happens. The emperor speaks, and the war is over. The war from the Japanese will not be over for hundreds of thousands of Japanese who the last POW 
is free from Russia 10 years after capture. And by the time they come back, you've got two different types. You've got the Akamatsu and you've got the Akadaikon. Akanatsu is basically your tomato, of which we had some small cherry tomatoes. Red on the outside, red on the inside. These were part of the prisoners that were indoctrinated, inculcated uh, into communism. Aku daikon are your radish, red on the outside, white on the inside. And when they get back to J Japan, they say to communism, screw you, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be Japanese. I'm communism. But for the next 15 years, communism is a real tough problem for the Japanese. And I was coming on the scene and I saw a lot of this uh, in the communist demonstrations. So at the end of the day, the end of this presentation is, we get down to the point of was dropping the atomic bomb number one, silver plate one, silver plate two, silver plate three, and yes, there was a silver plate three. And it was, uh, they sent a B-29 from Kenyan to pick up silver plate three, and it was about ready to turn around and head back to Kenyan, and the whole alert came in. Don't, we don't need it, the war's over. So, let's go back to the dual inquiry. We ask ourselves, you know, horrendous price was paid, uh, 16 bombers, what, what does 16 bombers mean in a whole scheme of things? They were, they would have been pushed off the Hornet, you know, if, if the carrier fleet had, had come at great risk. And that was the plan. And the crews, the Army pilots, would help push them off. And the fleet would turn around and come back. So now we get to the end of the war, and we look at the dual raid, and we say, what price for it? Well, in this case, it got to the end of the war. It's difficult to say that 300,000 people had to pay a horrendous price, uh, but everything was said and done. Uh, we just end up with uh, what Sherman had to say is war is hell. Thank you very much. Uh, today, in the command and general staff colleges, it is still argued that Doolittle should have been court-martialed because he was under strict orders, under no circumstances, would he go on the trip. And uh, so, as a result, the argument today is, how do you exonerate a commander that breaks orders that maybe is going to lose the next battle because he, because he disregarded orders? So, it's a fine line. I mean, they certainly didn't. All The only battle they won was, was public morale. Yes, sir. In the Marine Corps, we would say, fuck them. <laughs> 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 You're not <laughs> <those Marines>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have Roger Poor uh, died 628-02. And uh, uh, that picture that you saw up there was Roger. Cowboy. Oh, no, he's not the tall boy. That was Monsh. John, uh, did they receive any opposition from flak or fighter planes on the no. Doolittle raid? Very little. Very little. They were one plane uh, did uh, pick up a, a, a trailing fighter, uh, but it was a uh, kind of a low performer. Uh, there was some flak, but very little. And, and that brings up a good point: is that why would the Japanese want a picket ship that said? There's a carrier fleet, two carriers, four cruisers, X number of other vessels. Why wasn't there more uh, flak? There were barrage balloons, uh, uh, but uh, they weren't in any of the areas that these aircraft were involved with. But there's some speculation that uh, the Japanese went up into the uh, Alaska there because of that uh, little raid. I, I think that that's a, a good assumption, that that, that, that was probably one of the one of the kickbacks that would have occurred. Was there any speculation that the captain of the ship of the uh, should have continued onward and taken it closer to the coast? No. No. Uh, no. I, I think that's uh, pretty clear that 
uh, with the assets that we had lost at Pearl Harbor, the possibility that we could have risked two more uh, major uh, carriers. So there was two carriers then? Yeah. It, the energy, yeah. See, they had to put all of the uh, uh, TBDs down below to clear the deck, so there wasn't a fighter plane. One, two carriers, guys. One of the other carriers guys weren't. Enterprise. Huh? Enterprise. Enterprise. There were two of them going over. That's right. The Enterprise had all of their their aircraft on deck. Hornet had all of its aircraft below the deck, and the mission was that if they did come under attack, the uh, Enterprise would take the full brunt of, of the attack. Left. They would take the full brunt of the attack to save the carriers, while meanwhile the bombers either got off or were jettisoned, and the TBDs brought up on the uh, Hornet and joined a battle to get turned around. And they would not have plowed into Japanese waters any further. Yeah. They were gone. They would have gone back to their normal routine. Yes, ma'am. What did we find out after the war about the Japanese reaction to us bombing their homeland? Were they shocked? Were they We found that out almost immediately because they were still printing uh, the Japanese English Times, I think, and, and they reported on this. Uh, and you probably, if you don't know this, uh, and this, this went through almost to the end of the war, is that the, and Doodle called a shot on this, you will only hit military targets, you will purposely avoid any civilian targets, uh, and and you will not get anywhere close, close to the Imperial Guard, the Imperial Palace. Those were specific orders, and they knew what it looked like. We had a lot of intelligence, you know, and low-level intelligence. And so, uh, as a result, until they got to the end of the war, and we didn't know whether Trinity was going to work, and we decided to go for massive firebombing uh, at low levels, you know, and strip the B-29s down, uh, because the Japanese were pretty much out of the fight airborne-wise, to go in and lay down uh, large volumes of incendiaries. And of course they did that in Tokyo, Nagoya. They didn't touch Kobe, uh, Osaka, the industrial cities. So, you know, when, when they unleashed the incendiary war, which we had done, had been done in, in Europe, Dresden being the case, uh, you know, all of a sudden, the nature of war had changed to civilians are going to die by the hundreds of thousands. John? Yes? I think the reason the Japanese did not react earlier is when the picket ship reported those carriers, they, they, the Japanese thought they could not be as threat to them until they got close, much closer, because they were thinking of carrier-based aircraft. They never thought of B-25s. So they figured they had to put another 24 hours of war before the carriers would be close enough to actually be a threat to the whole islands. Your point is well made, Dave. The wonderment of it all is that the Hornet comes out of San Francisco in broad daylight. Uh, and tens of thousands of people saw the Hornet depart on the top uh, and with B-25s lashed to the deck and you think to yourself how could the Japanese not know at least at that point that there was something coming their way I mean, we weren't going to Italy with the horn the common knowledge was they uh, bring them to the island base or something Fly they were lifted on, they could be lifted off. Right. Yep. And what was the 500 pound bomb capacity of a B 24? B 25? Probably four. How many? Probably four. Four. Okay. Four thousand any, pounds. Any other inputs on that? I, that's any more questions? Oh, we've got a board meeting. Yeah. Tremendous, outstanding presentation.